preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Helene Geismar Katz, and I'm the Associate Executive Director for Programming here at the 92nd Street Y. It is my great pleasure, as always, to welcome you here this evening. Um, I wanted to tell you a few things that are coming up only because there are lots of things coming up and I wanted to make sure that you, uh, you remembered them. Um, next Thursday we have the Spitzer Lecture on the jury system, Valid or Obsolete, with Cynthia McFadden, Barry Sheck, Barry Sheck and um, moderated by Jack Ford. On Sunday, February 15th, Carol O'Connor will be with us. I'm looking. Uh, fe Tuesday, February 17th, we have a panel on women in American history, moderated by Gloria Steinem, with Wilma Mankiller, Gwendolyn Mink, and Barbara Smith. All of these, I want you to know, are getting close to being sold out, so I really, if you're interested, please call. Um, our Archaeology in the Ancient World series begins on February 22nd with the discovery of the real Mount Sinai. Well, yeah, you, you, you decide whether that's true or not. Um, and also that same evening, we have Joseph Heller, um, really the, the great novelist Joseph Heller, who will be interviewed by Kinky Friedman. Now, probably most of you don't know who he is, but the, for those of you who do, you can chuckle. Um, and let, no, I don't want to tell you about that one because that's sold out. And um, Finally, on, on Thursday, February 12th, one more time, we have um, our Artist Vision series with Matthew Barney. Um, now about tonight. I was going to say something about uh, thanking the president for um, making this evening particularly timely, but then I thought, you know what? This evening is always timely. There is always something going on, and we want to know how come these guys and they are all guys, decide um, to put this on or that on or, or whatever else. Um, it's, I think, always in our minds. Um, our moderator for the evening you know well. I have introduced him many times and in many different ways. I was told my last introduction of him was perfect, so I don't want to ruin it. So I'm just going to say to you, he is... Um, you hear him on radio every day, well, Monday through Friday from 12 to 2 on WNYC. His show is New York and Company. He does every day what we try to do every night. Uh, I am just very grateful that uh, he doesn't allow you into his studio audience because uh, otherwise I'm not so sure that you'd be in mine. Um, so thank you all for coming this evening and please join me in welcoming Leonard Lope. Thank you, Helene. Last spring, when we invited these three top broadcast news executives to compare notes here at the Y, we were thinking along the lines of a discussion of the usual topics that consume all of us folks in the media, like the focus on crime and the general tabloidization of the news, the perception that there's been an overall dumbing down in search of ratings, why there seems to be um, a dearth of foreign news coverage unless it involves famine or war, how to contend with the incredible speed of images nowadays, the growing differences between how the news is delivered by print, broadcasting, and the internet, and how much of that is determined by the conglomerates that own the media giants. We're going to talk about journalists, celebrities, breaches in the firewall between advertising and content, and why the public is increasingly infuriated with the media. But as we got closer to today's events, other matters have forced themselves onto the agenda. And you know who I'm talking about, Princess Di, Monica Lewinsky, and Matt Drudge. Talk about timing. Well, let's bring out these three people to talk about what's going on in the media and why we see what we see. William O. Wheatley Jr. has been Vice President of News at the National Broadcasting Company for the past five years. Previously, he was Executive Producer of the Brokaw Reports and NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. <laughs> Tom, 
Tom Nagorski has been foreign editor at the American Broadcasting Corporation's, or is it American Broadcasting Company? Company. Company's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings for the past five years. Before that, he was the ABC News producer in Moscow and in Berlin. And Robert Leveroni is the news director for Bloomberg Radio and Television, has been since its inception five years ago. Prior to joining the vast Bloomberg empire, he was a producer and reporter for the Financial News Network. So let's begin with the topic at hand. As uh, people who have been in this business for a long time, are you surprised by how, by how this Monica Lewinsky story has been playing out? Start with you, Bill. I think I've been surprised at the speed with which it's been playing out, and I think that reflects some of the changing nature of the media in America. Um, I don't want to compare this to Watergate in many ways, but in some ways you can compare it Surely. I'll just pull this a little closer. How's that? Um, if you go back to These the- These are broadcast people. They're professionals. Right. <laughs> Still wearing those little ones. Um, as you go back to the, uh, to the Watergate era, uh, in which there were revelations over a you know, relatively long period of time, and various facts were fished out either by the press or by grand juries and prosecutors, uh, and then compare that with the speed of what's going on now, um, in a 24-hour-a-day news world in which um, you have all news radio, you have 24-hour-a-day uh, cable channels like MSNBC and CNN and Fox News, you have the internet now, which is a very new and potent force in terms of speeding developments. So I think one of the things that surprised me is, is, is just how fast all this has been moving. And many people believe, and I, I think I'm among them, that it's moving a little too fast and that uh, we need, we in the press and uh, and for that matter, I think the prosecutor and even the, uh, the White House needs a little bit more time to be able to deal with this sort of dizzying uh, uh, fusillade of, of revelations that come out. Well, I, I, th I, I think it's a tremendous challenge because I don't care much for the story and I don't think any of us really do. I think what's interesting about it though is the fact that the news has come from so many different angles of, of communication, it's, it's, it's radio and TV, it's now, it's, it's one of the first big internet stories in my, in, in my judgment. And I think we've all talked about new technologies and how information is going to flow very fast. And I think that's all well and good and I think we're all going to learn how to take advantage of that in the next few years. But the interesting thing about this story is how misinformation has traveled so fast. And I, and I think that's all part of what's made this such a, a complicated story for, for those of us who are sitting here. Because you really, you really don't know where you stand on this. There's so, so few facts. And in some ways, it's shown exactly how powerless the press really is. Everybody complains about how powerful we are. In fact, we're very powerless. I mean, we're, we, we're reporting on things that other people are reporting. It's, it's not as uh, clear cut as, as we should Tom, be. before you get into this, I just want to follow up on yeah. what you both have been saying. And Tom, you're welcome to answer it first. Is that because this is a broadcast story? Watergate was really developed by the Washington Post and it took a long time before it finally went into print. But this is like the Princess Die story, something that first appeared on television. And now we see the newspapers following the, uh, the television uh, networks, in fact, in, in uh, revealing many of these stories. Um, actually, that may be the perception on that. 100% sure that that's true. The, uh, Get closer to your mic, Tom. I just said I'm, that may be the perception. It's certainly, I think, the overload that people feel now is probably due 90% to what we've put on television and on the radio. Uh, I think, though, th this was initially the work of a lot of print journalists who, uh, another difference this time around is that they have uh, you know, their names. Michael Isakoff of Newsweek was working on this for, I think, uh, you know, over a year. But didn't publish it. Didn't publish it for good reason because Kenneth Starr wasn't interested in it for, or was, but didn't feel he had credible evidence of the, the charges that he now feels he does. But what happened in terms of what Bill's talking about, the, the speed with which this took off, I think is entirely due to not only broadcast media and the internet, but these new broadcast 
programs. The, there is now a, uh, at even the best news organizations, there are people whose job it is to, you know, stay up to date with the cable shows, the talk shows, because it is not inconceivable that something will come out on those venues that needs to be checked out. That's where I think a lot of the misinformation is coming from, but there's just, for the public, I think, a, a wealth of stuff that may feel like... Uh, and, and there's a convergence going on here. Yeah. And it's, it's not necessarily true that the newspapers are terribly distinct from television or the internet now. Newspapers have internet sites. Newspaper reporters of magazine. Michael Isakoff not only works for Newsweek, but he works for MSNBC. So it's all sort of coming together, and that's sort of hastening the speed. You know, as Bill said, not only do we wish we had a little more time, we got a lot of space to fill now, much more than I think we ever had before. It's not just one half-hour nightly show. Uh, you're talking 24 hours uh, every day. But despite all the talk about the American public being glued to their radios and TVs in order to get the latest, juiciest tidbits in these alleged sex scandals, network newscasts, at least, have seen little change in their ratings. In the first week, the Nielsen show that from January 19th through the 25th, uh, ABC World News Tonight with Peter Jennings had a slight ratings increase from 8.5 to 9 one week, the week before to that one. Uh, there was Last week it was NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw that saw the increase. But interestingly, last year at this time, all three networks had ratings at around 10 when there was no scandal to attract viewers. So. Uh, is this a, a network news thing, or uh, are people just not watching network news anymore? Are they not interested in this story as it's presented by Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, and Peter Jennings? Well, uh, Bill, you're, the network you're no evening news Brokaw. ratings are tricky. Uh, the, um, the, the fact is that there's been a gradual erosion in the early evening network news program ratings over the years, and uh, it may well be that that continues to be reflected year to year versus the previous year. It's also true that the ratings for cable television have doubled in this period, so clearly there's interest in in, in, in a smaller group of people who watch the cable television in following uh, the story. So I, I'm not sure it's, that it's terribly easy to draw conclusions. Uh, one of the things just anecdotally, when I talk to people, particularly those outside of our business, they have said to me, I think the media is doing much too much on this. By the way, what's the latest? And, yeah. and it's pretty consistent. It's pretty consistent. But you, but you just have alternatives. You don't have to wait around till the evening newscast comes along. And in fact, uh, well, you're I, in cable. I'm in cable. I'm in radio. I'm in internet. I'm in, in a lot of other things too. But it, it's it, you know we 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 can't wait for that, and we're not producing just for that. And I think that uh, people who are interested in news now, they're not waiting for it either. I mean, they're going out and they want to get the news when they want it. And I think that uh, the, the real future of this and what this story is showing you, that people want to get it the way they want it, they'll get it any way they can. And that's why I say it's a very good example of how the new, newer technologies now, they're still in their infancy, uh, will become very powerful. So this has been good for Bloomberg, radio and television? Is there a difference no, between... No, I hate it. I hate the story. I don't want to... I don't no, wanna... but I'm just we talking about in we terms of started, attracting we an audience. Word, we didn't want to use the word scandal. Uh, because uh, here you had the principals involved both denying anything happened, so there really wasn't a scandal. Uh, allegation, if you take a very legalistic interpretation of it, it's not really an allegation. I mean, an al who's, who's doing the alleging? I mean, it's, it's based on rumors. Somebody said, well, he said that she said, and I think I heard it on the tape, but no one's heard the tape. Um, so, no, I think it's been terrible for us. <laughs> I also think it's worth, and this comes from a frustration Bill probably feels as well, correcting an impression, although I can understand why it exists, that we are covering this to help boost our ratings. There is, on the Friday after this broke, a lot of us had just returned from Cuba, and that's a source of great frustration to the foreign news editor. But we sat around in a room, and while these are people who've been in the news profession for a lot longer than I have for, for the most part, there was a discussion that I don't think would have been very much unlike a discussion 10 people anywhere would have had about the ramifications, the questions that were being asked. Uh, who's Kenneth Starr? Why does he have the sort of powers that he does? I mean, people is at ABC there, don't know who Kenneth Starr is? Well, in, who in the big sense. And every single issue that came up or every question that came up, we pursued. We didn't put it all on the air, but we put a lot of it on the air. And for a while, again, there was 
there was overload. I think it subsided very quickly. That's another interesting facet to this story that it had almost vanished in 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 wall to wall coverage sense. About. Well, what does uh, a story like this mean to foreign news coverage? Is are those the first slots that are sacrificed for time? Not necessarily. As a matter of fact, in those first few days, Jennings w was as I guess all of the anchors were a little, uh, well, initially very reluctant to leave. We, it was, it was a strange that? situation. This is, I guess, the Wednesday morning. It's only two weeks ago, which is, to me, a stunning, mm -hmm. uh, seems strange. But we were in a hotel room waiting for the Pope to arrive. And, and this is one of those stories, not unlike the, the Hong Kong turnover last year, that had a lot of run-up. We'd done an awful lot of work, and, and people were clearly interested. And we'd been down there for two days, and, and people, there, there were a couple of ABC executives down there who came rushing in and said, Peter, you're going back to Washington, and here's why. And he shut himself up in a room for a little while and said, look, you, you know, let me make up my own mind. Let me read all this stuff. Let me make some phone calls. Cokie Roberts was down there, and they had a long discussion, and then he came back. For a few days, I mean, we, we covered probably half the extent that we would have the papal trip. And... Uh, that really is the one story that suffered dramatically at the time. Well, according to the Tyndall report in the first week, the now I'm leaving you out for just a moment, but Sorry. we'll get back to you. The, uh, the evening newscasts devoted 116 minutes out of 330 minutes. These are the big three newscasts. Uh, and 125 minutes last week. So we're talking about almost half both weeks to this one story. Iraq was the second most covered story. It got 29 minutes on all three networks. So we're really uh, talking that, about a that's, disproportionate that's, that's a growing event. story as well, Iraq, and it's getting more and more time. And it's but that might be a war, and we're talking that's here about. Correct. Uh, but but I, I. Can I say it? I can say it here, right? I, I wouldn't yeah. underestimate the seriousness of the Washington story. I think we have to be careful here. Uh, yes, it's a story that none of us particularly like, but it is potentially a very serious story. and. Um, it goes to the issue of, uh, of the, um, the president, the moral authority, truth teller, uh, and, and we'll see that these allegations hold any water at all and the possibility of someone who interfered with the legal process illegally. So th this is serious business. Um, it's prurient business too, I understand that, but it's, it's serious business and, and there's, there's more to be reported on it we don't know yet what that is, but there will be other developments that are quite, quite proper, properly will be serious developments. Well, you said all three of you have said you haven't liked this story, and I, I wonder whether when a story comes in that you don't like, uh, you can actually say, well, we won't give it as much time, or do you say, well, if we do, the other networks are going to kill us. Obviously, CBS was really ridiculed for not going right to Princess Di, even though the other networks gave us a lot more than we needed to know. We went on and on and on repeating the same stuff. Uh, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't here, aren't you? Well, that's not unusual for us. <laughs> well, I think the, the, since there are so many players now in the news business, and we all at some point have to diverge. We have to take a different approach. For a long time as well, we have three nightly newscasts. Which one do you watch? Now you have half a dozen all news cable channels uh, available to you certainly here in New York uh, and uh, you can see our programming uh, as well which is a cable and satellite delivered and it is all news and, and, and at some point we all have to diverge here we have to provide something different I mean our approach uh, for those of you who know our company is very much involved with business in the worldwide financial markets we do take a very international view we take a, uh, a view where we follow money around the world and if you look at our editors and those of us will, will, will sit down and say well is the market reacting to, to uh, Princess Diana, or is the, is the market reacting to Clinton's credibility? Uh, because I'll tell you something, if, if there really is a doubt there, or uh, there's a tremendous burst of confidence, it is reflected in the financial markets. I mean, you can really, you, you can take that to the bank. I mean, you can really see money move. And in fact, in this story, 
it, it hasn't moved very much. And so we uh, have gone back to our knitting and covered the things that we do really well, which we think are money, the business approach, and, and putting the world of business and money in a worldwide context. You know, not just talking about stocks and bonds, but talking about how economies are affected by news. Uh, talking about stories, whether it's locally or on a national basis, that have a, an angle that affect your pocketbook. And, uh, you know, everybody's interested about money. I think that's a far bigger story. Mm -hmm. Although uh, you also want to tell people that WBBR is not really a financial station. That's your local challenger to WINS and CBS, all news. Yeah. Uh, but you have also uh, been different from the others in that you have de-emphasized crime stories. And that's probably why you have the you have lower ratings than the other guys. To some degree, you can you can take the high road, and uh, and everybody will slap you on the back. On the other hand, people turn turn into winds to find out who has been murdered in Queens. It's it's a I think it's a different audience. I think the audience is getting increasingly fragmented, and I think you'll see much more of that. Uh, the trick is is the one thing we we can talk here all we want about 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 news, but. We're still in a very commercial business. Uh, we do make money uh, based on the fact that people watch or listen to our programming, and our salespeople can go out and take that information and 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 make money with it. Uh, I think we here in trying to take the high road a little bit is just is a very conscious decision on our part to try to do the news a little bit differently. Uh, if we feel as though local news, a uh, little more tabloid news, some of our uh, our commercials talk about all crime all the time on some of these other stations, and there's a lot of jokes and a lot of talk in the journalism business about local news, particularly on television. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, I, we we can talk about all that, but but putting that aside, clearly a certain segment of the population likes that, and you can't deny that and, and a lot of local news and these and the other all news stations make a tremendous amount of money on it um, we uh, just as a company have tried to set out a vision try to do what we want to do fortunately we have a very active business in many many ways both in radio and TV and so we can we support ourselves by not just running a local station by running uh, 100 radio affiliates and internet and six different television networks I mean uh, but it's the same thrust here the same story we're trying to find what we think is interesting, trying to take a little more of a world view. And there are all people out there who are very interested. Well, how do you distinguish yourself in the nightly news, the, the network news shows? Uh, I switch back and forth as much as I can. I guess if I were really compulsive, I would videotape uh, on two different machines while I watch the third one. But to some degree, you don't have to, because when you, when you flip back and forth, you find out that all the stations are pretty much covering the same stories. The big difference is that one might lead with one, one might lead with another. But uh, we're, there's a, an awful lot of stories that don't get covered. If you ever watch ITN News on Channel 21, the British service, you realize that an awful lot of stuff, especially foreign news that's of importance, doesn't get on to the nightly news shows. How do you decide, Bill, because you uh, did the NBC Nightly News for quite a while, what to put on, what not to put on, what's important, what isn't? Well, it, it's, a, it's a combination of factors I think you, you bring to bear. Um, you try to apply some criteria. You, uh, what's important is a good start. Um, what's relevant, um, to some extent what's interesting. Uh, we are in a commercial um, atmosphere. And and um, and ratings are important. Ratings are important, but it's very difficult to tie any particular programming format or or story selection to ratings. I, I I've looked at that over the years, and I I don't see that. You know, you can't say, well, we did such and such a story last night, so our ratings went up. Mm -hmm. That doesn't that doesn't seem to be the case. But um, I think it it it's true that. Uh, that they, there is some unanimity among the three network news program executive producers as to a certain group of stories that will be on in any given night. The big uh, difference is those little features at the end, uh, focus right. on America and those kinds right. of things. That, we find out from one about a farmer who also sculpts, and then we find out on another one about uh, somebody else who is helping poor children in the neighborhood. We don't find out about East Timor. We don't find out about what's going on in Rwanda. Right. And I think there, there has been a trend in recent years in American television news, uh, certainly after, after the Gulf War, after the collapse of communism, to concentrate on foreign story, stories that have direct relevance to the United States. Uh, and the sort of feature story or story about a conflict um, that, while it might be horrible, 
uh, doesn't affect our audience tend to get pushed aside now. I don't, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, I, I think that's unfortunate to a point, but um, the fact remains that there's a limited amount of time on those news programs. And having been the executive producer of the nightly news in a period during the collapse of communism, we probably went the other way in that I can recall doing programs where 70 or 80 percent of the program on a given night was about what was going on in Eastern Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and perhaps we had gone too far in that direction. The other thing is that the, the stakes have changed. And, and when we were living on the edge of a nuclear war, <laughs> possibility of a nuclear war, everything had a certain importance and vitality to it that it's a lot harder to have now. I, I, was, I saw a feature recently on Lithuania, and I remember putting stories on in Lithuania, and they seemed like the most important thing in the world at the time, mm -hmm. when, uh, when they were standing up to the Russians at all. It, it, it seems sort of quaint now to me, and, and strangely irrelevant. Tom, does it seem quaint to you? It does, and it does. The foreign editor. The foreign editor, right. <laughs> I'm starting to feel like the defensive member of this panel. Um, I'll just make a couple of points. First of all, and again, I don't know how uh, clear a distinction a viewer draws, but I, there is, I think you would agree, there's a pretty clear distinction right now anyway between the NBC Nightly News and World News Tonight at ABC. And we can get into that more later if you'd like. Secondly, uh, on the point about serious stuff getting frozen out or uh, uh, the, the farmer features at the end of the program. We, we devote now, and we've only, there's a new format at our program, but we devote three, four minutes in the middle of the broadcast now uh, to a more, I actually think it's a little bit more akin to uh, the Nightline in, in small form or the McNeil Lehrer Show in that we take an issue or a story and do perhaps a short piece and then talk to one of the principals involved. We uh, look at, at some of the, the background. We treat it in some broader uh, uh, scope than just doing a fleeting mention. Now, when, we, when that's an overseas story, as it was last night, as it's been a few times with the Asian economic crisis, you get a ton of foreign coverage, practically half the program, almost instantly. When it isn't, and certainly in the last few weeks, that's been the case more often than not, you freeze out a lot of the stories that Bill is talking about that are mid-level. They're not obviously front page tomorrow, even in the New York Times and Washington Post. I do share a feeling, having covered a lot of those stories that you were putting on uh, your broadcast some time ago, that there are big, big swaths of the world today where if you're a producer or correspondent and you want to make the case that a story, not only in Eastern Europe or the former Soviet Union, but even in Western Europe, where politically we were so much more interested, I think, back then as Americans in an election in Germany or Italy because we cared about the, the makeup, the leftward or rightward tilt of a government there. And we will still be interested in, and I do think we do more stories like that than NBC does in human interest stories from around the, the globe. But they are tougher cells when they're up sort of even Stephen against a good human interest story from the U.S. I don't think it's as bad as you make it out to be. Though. Now, Bob, your Bloomberg has 60 foreign offices, foreign yes. bureaus. So is it different when you're uh, reporting? Did, they don't report to those other countries, do they? Uh, some of them do, yes. No. Uh, we produce uh, six foreign language television networks uh, in Spain, France, Italy, uh, English language in the UK, uh, we do Brazil, uh, we do a Japanese language in Japan, English language in the, uh, the Pacific Rim, and also English language here. I, I was going to make the point, one of the big stories last week, uh, there was a world economic conference uh, in Switzerland at a place called Davos. Mm -hmm. And for the last few years, this has become one of the most critical meetings of anybody who's interested in economic affairs and how it affects the world. Uh, and I would say, I, I don't know, it sounds like hyperbole, but the great leaders of the world and economy were there talking about what's going to be happen, uh, what's going to happen with European unification of their currency, uh, what's going on with the economy in, in the Pacific Rim, particularly uh, Korea, and how it's going to affect all of us. 
uh, whether or not there is a lot of European and world support for an invasion or a, a, a military action against Iraq. Uh, Bill Gates gave a number of uh, well-attended speeches. Certainly the gentleman I worked for, Michael Bloomberg, was very actively there. Uh, from, from the United States, Hillary Clinton uh, spoke, uh, and I recall covering that uh, Governor Christie Whitman did not want to miss it this year for, uh, for a number of reasons. But, but beyond that, this was, this was a, a, an economic conference that did cover a lot of these big issues. And I found that uh, in the New York Times, I found virtually no coverage on it. Um, I don't know about your program. I, I think I, I watched it occasionally and, and didn't see anything on it. Uh, NPR covered it. Jim Bitterman. Very good. OK, good. Uh, we, uh, on the other hand, our European bureaus were, you know, we've got to get satellites. We've got to do this. We've got to do interviews. We had, you know, a dozen interviews lined up every day. We, you know, we've got to talk to George Soros and all these people involved with uh, the world. And so we put this on. Uh, did, did our audience find it interesting? I hope so. But in fact, I don't, you know, there was a real, there's a communication gap here. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't follow through to this country for some reason. People talk about news being primarily local, and local news is very potent. Clearly, uh, you want to find out about your community, and your community can just be your neighborhood. Your community can be just your country. And uh, when you get out beyond that, you don't care because a lot of these these things don't affect you or maybe we don't do a good enough job of showing how they do affect you. My own, if I can just add one point about that, my own experience with conferences uh, like the Davos conference, which comes up every year, is that my bosses, and I've had several, will always say, get me a story. We had a piece on last night about a marketplace in Thailand where the, the, the sort of formerly rich, the, this big middle-class bastion there has gone broke in the last six months or so, and there's a place now where they go and sell all their uh, luxury goods that Those they can't afford factors. anymore. My boss will say to me, I don't want to hear speeches at, at Davos. I want to hear, and that may just be a function of the evening news and, and a, f a format. I don't know how much time Bitterman had to do his piece, but that's a tough sell on the evening news, and I think it, it always has been, unless there's a major political story and who's but, going. And but, but it's nice, but, but there are other places now where you can get this, you see. Yeah. And, and you can get We're it getting more and more specialization. Right. We're or actually you, you having You could have got it on the internet, or casting. if you had a Bloomberg terminal, you can call up and listen to all the speeches you want. So, I, I, so has narrow casting really finally come into effect after all these years of us talking about it with cable, so that the networks are freed to do something more general, and is that good? Well, I, th I think the networks have always been pretty general, um, and we haven't necessarily uh, targeted small portions. We're mass media. Um, I but think you know, in the, I'm sorry to interrupt for just a second, but to, to follow this up, uh, all the old timers talk about the old days when news was considered a loss leader, ratings were not the most important thing, uh, we, we can especially criticize CBS because nobody from CBS is here. Uh, but, you know, they, th especially those old timers from CBS, the Tiffany Network, we had the greatest news. When cost was no object. What was really important was doing the best job possible. And now it's totally ratings driven. And as a result, everything has gone to hell in a handbasket. Well, uh, having worked at NBC for 23 years, I, when I was young, I was an old timer. Right? <laughs> uh, I, I, I think there's some truth to that, but I think sometimes their memories are different from the reality. And it's, it is true that you saw on the CBS Evening News or the Huntley Brinkley Report on NBC uh, a certain amount of reporting from certain key foreign capitals, London, Paris, Rome, that sort of thing. Uh, they were often about national affairs in those countries. But it's also true, if you look back at some of those programs, that they weren't doing a, nearly as good a job as covering news in the United States, and put, including some very important social trends that were going on in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and, and there were relatively few bureaus in the United States. There were, in, in, the, in the 60s, there were probably more bureaus overseas for the networks than in the United States. And, and, and I think that needs saying. Um, on, on the question of what's general versus narrow, I think it's important that the network news be general to a general audience. Uh, I, you were talking about Davos and the Asian economic crisis, and ABC did a good piece last night in Thailand. What we probably would do, um, 
or will, and will be doing is more and more stories about how that Asian economic crisis is affecting us here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And actually it hit home to me just yesterday when a Korean broadcaster to whom we supply material wrote to me and said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cancel your contract. We're broke. Wow. I, I wonder about what those old timers think about the coverage of this latest story considering what we've learned about JFK from Seymour Hersh, mm -hmm. can you imagine what, um, what a field day would, they would have had with him if the rules were the same in the 60s as they are now? Well, I think there's probably still a little bit of that standard. I mean, I, now this is speculation, okay, I'll add to the rumors. I mean, it seems to me that over the last year and a half, two years, however long, this relationship that uh, we've been covering here, or, or supposed relationship uh, the president had, you know, if, if in, in fact there were, it was this deep a story, you've got hundreds of reporters in Washington, D.C. on any given day. And many of them have sources, uh, you know, truthful, not truthful, uh, rumors fly every day, uh, people see things, they talk about them, they don't talk about them. You know, this story, how did this story come out? I mean, the story had to come out through, you know, I guess finally one person did get the story, but it, there seems to be a fair amount of subterfuge there. But with all those people out there, you know, either they knew something and didn't want to talk about it, or they heard about something and didn't want to talk about it. And, and I think that's what makes us all feel very uncomfortable, because in a certain way, like we said, we don't want to do this story. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we can use it still as a framework for looking into all the other issues I wanted to deal with tonight, because it seems to encompass all of the, the, the subjects uh, that uh, are of interest in, in the way that we cover the news these days. I don't want to add to the feeding frenzy, but and if you ever feel the need to digress into some other topic, please do. But I, I recently saw an interview with Bill Moyers where he kept referring to the intensity and velocity of news today and the giant maw of media, cable, internet, et cetera, that has to be filled. And he also talked in, uh, in, in reference to this case about the way rumors have become news. He wondered, what's happened to Ben Bradley's golden rule? Check your facts once, twice, and then again. And uh, he said that's why the Watergate case took so long to develop. Marvin Kalb said it another way. He said we ought to check first, report second, not the other way around. Is it because? Well, is it because there's this giant maw and we just have to fill it uh, that we're, we're seeing this story develop the way that it does with a lot of things reported and then backtracking days later? Well, I think it, it is true that the overwhelming number of journalists and journalistic organizations, you know, major organizations, continue to check their stories. And, and, and I think the problem has been, to the extent that there is a problem, is that they have reported other stories without necessarily independently verifying them. And that's, that's, that's a tricky business, too. Uh, and we had a very good example of it just yesterday, where the Wall Street Journal published a report, first on their internet service, interestingly enough, um, which was uh, which eventually, in fairly short order, was denied uh, by uh, by the lawyers for the principal that they reported on, and and we had a debate in our own newsroom whether to even mention this story, uh, and in and and in certain ways uh, you make it you make your judgments on the record of the institution that's making the report. When the New York Times reported the other morning the number of visits that uh, Monica Lewinsky had made to the White House, um, it, 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 was, it was difficult certainly to check that independently overnight. Most organizations reported it because they believe that the Times has an outstanding record for, for accuracy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what played out yesterday on the Wall Street Journal. Uh, however, it's interesting because when we reported it, we had already gotten a denial from the lawyers. We reported that a controversy was developing over this story, mm -hmm. which you could say is an awful hedge. But we felt it important because people are now beginning to hear this elsewhere. It was on the Associated Press, which means it's going out to every major news organization in the United States and a lot of minor ones that are reporting on local radio, that sort of thing. We, 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 we thought it important to mention it briefly and to, to say there's a controversy developing. Well, the press more and more is reporting on the press. We, uh, there was an, another interesting uh, case 
uh, with involving the New York Times when Richard Seed announced that he wanted to clone a human. It was the, the lead story on most radio news uh, and on most TV news shows. And the Times didn't want to publish it because they considered him a nut. They didn't think that they should give credibility. But the next day, they had to cover it because now it was a national story. Now, I don't know whether they were right in deciding not to cover it. I thought they should probably have put it on page 36, like they do everything else they don't want us to read, and, and, get, it, and get it over with. But instead, they censored the story in a way and then were forced to play it up bigger the next day because they hadn't played it the first day. Yeah, I think what happened with Mr. Seed was you had a, it's not so much a source issue, but you had a guy who uh, was on, a nut. on first, well, on first contact, uh, you know, our health reporters contacted him and had that same reaction, but then they had, it was from, from NPR, a, uh, right. I, I can't we remember the reporter's there. name, but he had, wasn't Jim Bitterman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and again, there, it, it achieves a certain, level of uh, credibility, if you will. I think on the sourcing, though, I don't know, and I, again, I am not as immersed in this as some of my colleagues are, I don't think that, again, in the mainstream, in the main big newspapers, and at, at least on the program I work for, I don't think there have been a lot of mistakes. There's a famous one now that the, the Dallas Morning News uh, reported this story about a uh, someone in the Secret Service actually having, having seen something at the White House. Right. And what happened then is, is the people at, at Nightline at ABC were faced with a, I think it came out again on their, their web page, uh, where, where more and more of these institutions seem to float stories. And it was probably at about 20 after 11 that somebody first noticed it. And there was a, you know, a very heated discussion at Nightline about what to do. And they felt the Dallas Morning News was a, a good news organization, and they just reported that the Dallas Morning News had done so. The Dallas Morning News then retracted that story, and then I think retracted the retraction. I don't know. That where was a Secret were. Service uh, agent uh, having witnessed the president and Monica Lewinsky in flagranti delecto. But, the, but I don't want, mean to embarrass you, Tom, but Please. there is a story uh, which was played up big on Peter Jennings' program of the navy blue dress that Monica Lewinsky had reportedly kept in her closet for four years with the president's semen stains on it. And when I first saw that on Jackie Judd's report, I thought, either Monica Lewinsky is really weird keeping a dress in her closet for four years with these semen stains, or Jackie Judd is out of her bird. She did not verify that story, and she repeated it on 2020. Then a week later, Scott Pelley of CBS News reported that no DNA evidence or stains had been found on the dress or any of her other clothing that the FBI had seized from her closet. But, uh, I, it was a damaging story, and it had been repeated on ABC. And then Jackie Judd says, in defense of herself, that all of the clothing had been dry cleaned. Well, gee, it was four years, you know. Um, and so she's suggesting that it could have had the president's semen on it. And now we have a cover up from Monica Lewinsky because she no, took it to no, the dry no, cleaner. No. I wish Jackie was here. You know that she is, uh, she's a fabulous reporter. It's sort of an odd thing for someone like herself who has never really been in the limelight at all. She's not at all one of the sort of famous celebrity journalist in any way. She's a great, solid reporter. I believe what happened was she got several sources, more than two. Believe me, there was a long discussion. I was not privy to it about whether to even mention the story. The, uh, you know, it, it is, it, it's not something that she gleefully came in and said, look what I've got. But the, the, the story was that Miss Lewinsky had boasted of this to not only her colleagues, but also to people involved in the investigation. Now, that's what she reported. She didn't report that such a dress did exist. She reported that Miss Lewinsky, who was now the subject of, a, uh, of, of this whole mess, had made those allegations. Now, still, there was, a, there was consternation over whether even to mention that. Uh, and we did, and that was probably a mistake, but it is, it, this is not an issue of bad sourcing. It's an issue of what I think you first brought up, that this is a story in which if you 
dip in at all, it's it's horrible from the get-go. But then we have the local papers picking up the story from Jackie Judd, and the New York Post headline the next day was Monica's love dress. The news said she kept sex dress. Uh, the the news at least said it was alleged. The Post didn't even bother. They just simply said there was this navy blue dress. Now, I don't know about navy and semen, but uh, there were some other kind of... I'm sorry. <laughs> Still, it, it, this, I'll bet you that the great majority of Americans who heard that story have no idea that this clothing turned up to not have any of the president's DNA on it. Right. I, I, it's a fair point. We reported at, at infinitum the stuff that came out later. I mean, the fact that they had gone ahead and tested it. Uh, I actually don't even want to talk about it. Anymore. Yeah, but, uh, but okay, but the question is, where do these stories come from? Uh, do they reflect every leak from someone in Ken Starr's office uh, becoming a news story? How have Linda Tripp, Lucianne Goldberg, and Matt Drudge come to be considered legitimate news sources? And I think that's the, the issue that a lot of people are asking themselves. In the past, we would have said, Richard Seed's a nut. Don't even tell that story unless he actually clones a human or comes close to cloning a human. And these other people are people with bad track records. Why are we even giving them any credibility? I, I think you come back to Mr. Starr because we ignored it for a while. I, again, I don't know what the level of ABC's reporting on this was while Mr. Isakoff was digging around, but people knew Ms. Lewinsky's name and knew the allegations. And nobody, not even tabloid news organizations, were doing anything with it. When the independent counsel, whether you like him or not, whether you appreciate or agree with the powers that that in institution has been given, comes out and says there are credible charges, then you, you, you it matters. And, and again, we have to then, I think, whether the public likes it or not, and oddly enough, it, it's a tabloid story that doesn't seem, as you pointed out earlier, to be having any I mean, I think people are tuning out, and I think it's probably a ratings sinkhole. Well, actually, as uh, you pointed out earlier, on the one hand, the people are talking about how offended they are, and then they're telling the latest Clinton joke. Uh, so we, we're having it both ways, and I think probably the news sh uh, shows are reflecting that ambivalence we have about this. But I wonder whether you think that this is unique to this situation or this president. He's vulnerable on sex stories, so we're doing it? Or is this where American news gathering is headed? Are we becoming more like the British press? Are we becoming more Rupert Murdoch? I, I think this is one example. I think there probably be, will be others. Um, I think a lot of it, there's a tremendous competitive nature in news now. I mean, there always was competition to get the story and be the person to break it. I mean, that, that that's, was always there. But now, you magnify that by hundreds of news organizations. I think when we going back to the old days, uh, there were probably very few companies who could marshal the finances and the resources to have a worldwide news organization. And so they became, you know, arbiters of the news in the sense. Now, you don't have to have any money at all. I mean, you can just uh, go into a chat room. You can, uh, you know, uh, make a, a couple of phone calls. And the next thing you know, you're, you're a credible source. You're a source. You start the train moving, so to speak. Uh, and if there are enough people get caught up in this, pick up on the competition, it takes on a life of its own. The fact is, if all of a sudden we, we turn out that there are some very, very damaging facts to the president uh, in, in this story, uh, do we end up looking like heroes? I don't know. I, mean, I don't know if we can ever win in this one. I think one of the things that's changed, too, is that an increasing number of these stories are becoming diversions for the American public. And, and, and stories like the O.J. Simpson story and the nanny trial and that sort of thing. There's we almost lot. need them. It's well, kind of like the Romans they, with yeah, the lions well, it, and the yes, gladiators. That analogy occurred to me too. It's sort of bread and circuses, but the 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 fact is that a portion of the American public, and it, it's not huge, but it's sizable, uh, it finds itself being sucked into these stories and following them very closely and talking about them and catching up in the latest. I think the fact that there's uh, cameras in courtrooms has certainly accelerated that. 
um, and and they have become diversions. And uh, and even if the networks and the mainstream press largely stayed away from them, there are so many other sources of of uh, of communication, of broadcasting, and, and and that sort of thing, that inevitably people would 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 learn them and and uh, and and would uh, follow them in any case. So I, I think we feel some pressure. If everyone's talking about this story, why are we not doing it? Mm-hmm. Then there, there's another aspect to this. Uh, there are the news magazine shows, which often break these stories. And then there's a feeling in some circles that the, uh, the local news shows are, and, the, and the national shows are starting to look a bit more alike, the blurring of the images uh, between one and the other. And so in the end, the whole thing is going to turn out to be some kind of a huge news magazine, entertainment Tonight is it, uh, or you know, um, those kinds of shows merging in with they usually follow the nightly news anyway. People aren't sure where one ends and one the other one begins. Well, maybe we're in the in the final throes of the of the old way of doing news. I mean, I maybe that doesn't isn't going to work anymore. Maybe there's going to be a couple of different tiers of the news, if you will where you have the, uh, the sensationalistic tabloid stories now in all the media, not just at the, at the grocery store, uh, that you have another level of news that uh, ideally, let's say in an ideal world, would be non-commercial, which uh, would deal more in facts and all. But you know, in a lot of countries where people try to practice that, uh, they get shot. Unfortunately, we forget that, and a lot of us uh, here who practice the news have the luxury of being able to sit in a panel like this and sit with our millions of dollars of resources at our disposal every single day and, and, and laugh about this a little bit. But in fact, news is a very serious business in many places in the world, and, and that doesn't get covered nearly enough. Um, so I, I just wondered if, if, if the news business is going to diverge into a couple of different directions where you are going to have this... Uh, I, I, I want to use talk radio as an analogy where you have this talk radio where people feel tremendously participatory. And so opinions fly, commentary flies, a lot of misinformation flies. Maybe there's a, ger- a kernel of truth in all of this, there's a reality in it. And then over here, you're going to have strictly factual reporting. And then you, maybe that'll just be too boring for people. I don't know. But I, but I, I and, and I honestly don't, I guess what I'm grasping at is I'm trying to find out where the center is and where, you know, people will truly turn for, uh, for appropriate information. That's, that's a real challenge for all of us now. I, I just want to make one other point, my defensive nature rising again. I, I do think that while I, again, understand the, the emotions and the feelings about the media that have been proliferating in the last few weeks, if you look at the evening news on, on ABC, and I don't mean to be a shill, but the it is a serious, sober program. It's not a sensationalist program in the least. It, we devoted six minutes the other night to a thorough examination of, of the Clinton budget. It was, it was probably boring. We're in third place. <laughs> We're, but, yeah, but that but goes back is, and forth. That's kind of weird, isn't it? I always wonder go why one goes up and one goes down. But okay, but you're in third place at the moment have, because of that report. Well, <laughs> I, I'm being flipped, but I, I we only do did think two minutes, that, I think, on the budget. But <laughs> that there is a huge distinction between even Bill Butel's fine program at six o'clock here in New York and the program you get at six thirty that follows him. I, I don't know what the viewers. Think. You do a, a wonderful half-hour show. Thank you. But but you know, but 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 what the, I think the reality out there now more and more is the fact that a lot of people sitting in this audience, now they probably didn't see your show tonight, all right? So maybe they want to go back and take a look at it. So they're going to try to find a way to do that. And more and more technology is going to be going to give them the opportunity to go back and do that. They'll go back and look at your program. They'll sample a little bit of mine, a little bit is going on in NBC. They might listen to NPR. They'll listen to something else. And then they'll, then they'll form a, a much larger opinion. And, and all of us are very just very small parts of that. Um, so you can do some serious stories, but in fact, there are people out there who wish you did six hours on the budget. Uh, they, they have a channel for that, C-SPAN, right? Or, or they can, uh, people who want to spend hours uh, with Mon- Monica Lewinsky. I, th- the other thing, what really did it for me, unfortunately, with a lot of this news is a couple weeks ago, I was watching um, in the newsroom, I have all the monitors going, and I saw Fox News and MSNBC and CNN and a few other stations all carrying Sonny Bono's funeral. 
and live coverage of Sonny Bono's funeral. And I thought, he's a public servant, and I, I think that's nice, and they clearly showed a lot of respect in what they were doing. But the thing is, I realized after a while I was watching it, I had this sinking feeling what they really wanted was uh, not to miss Cher, mm -hmm. who was going to be giving a, a eulogy. And, and sure enough, at a certain point, she came on and uh, was very articulate and uh, seemed to do a fine job. Uh, I was, since we cover the financial markets, I was particularly interested to see that one of the stations, uh, Fox actually, in the corner of the screen while Cher is talking very emotional and she's crying, there is a little box with the Dow Jones Industrial <laughs> Average. And then it switched to the NASDAQ. And I thought, this is, th this is news run wild here, all right? And, uh, you know, I, we're going to try to do it differently. We're going to tell you. But <laughs> I, I think that on the whole, you're all saying that we have a real great news delivery service in this country. We have the most freedom in our press. And um, we really do get all the information we want, maybe more than we want sometimes. But OK, in the end, it's a terrific situation for us all. And yet, the American public is angrier than ever at the media. and. You have to wonder why. Have, are they not getting it? Are they are they not appreciating? But they are. What you are they read the about? polls. Oh. Now, now uh, journalists, I think, are slightly lower than lawyers in their estimation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does it bother you? Do people uh, do people yell at you at parties? <laughs> I, I, I think it's a cause for worry, definitely, uh, and and I think maybe. People are, diff are angry for different reasons. Um, I think they, many of them, feel the media is ar are arrogant. Uh, 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 I, I, for one, uh, don't like the trend of uh, reporters being considered commentators in many forums that they participate in, and uh, being expected uh, to uh, not only tell you what happened, uh, but their opinion of why it happened. I, I, I don't, I don't much like that. We've certainly been having a lot of discussions about that. That's the European style. Recently, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I, I don't think though that you should undervalue the fact that we often bring people bad news. That's not a great position to be in, to be liked. Um, but there, there, it's clear that that more and more people are finding fault with what we do, and I think we ignore that at our our peril. In the old days, they used to complain that there was no good news, and then a couple of stations actually try to have good news features, and they usually wind up number three in a market of three. So I actually, I, I, the public doesn't seem to know what it really wants. Yeah, one, one complaint I hear fairly frequently, given that not that many people watch C-SPAN, I will hear about political coverage that if you look at C-SPAN and somebody has seen an entire speech or an entire event or a campaign, something, and then they see a nugget that's on the evening news, there's some resentment because that really baldly shows what the editing process is like. And as many, you know, there may be 10 of us in a room deciding exactly how to nail down what's important, other people would make a different judgment. They feel that you missed something. They feel that you have a bias one way or the other. And uh, that always existed. There's always been editors. But maybe things like C-SPAN or other avenues where they can see and hear much, much more of it have irritated people because they think, well, what'd you do, you know? Well, Lou Who are you is, to decide what uh, what little, f you know, 50-second item gets on the news? Lou Cannon has pointed out in his new book that the Rodney King tape that we all know was edited, and the whole part where he charged the cops was cut out. Uh, in no way did it eliminate the, the fact that at one point Officer Powell just kept on smashing him, but it was different without that major portion of the videotape to give us some sense of how we went from point A to point D. So um, there are news judgments that are made that really will affect the way we perceive this world. Uh, you know, just a, a tape edit. In a few moments, we're going to have uh, some questions from this crowd. I, before we get to them, uh, I'm curious about how you guys got to where you are in in print medium, uh, the usually reporters work their way up to become editors and 
if they really are, are successful, marry the boss's daughter, the publisher. But what happens with you? Did you all start as reporters? Um, in my case, I, uh, I started as a writer for a television station in Boston on their news programs when I was a student, and then worked my way behind the scenes jobs, and then became a reporter for a while. And, decided before my news director decided for me that my re real career was behind the scenes and uh, and then went on came to NBC and began to produce programs for news programs for NBC Tom you were a reporter uh, I actually started as a researcher and worked my way up to producer slash reporter and uh, got to my current job after several years overseas as a producer and reporter mm -hmm. I started out really in TV as a, as a producer, uh, producing television programs uh, about the financial markets and about it, uh, investments and all, and came to work for uh, Bloomberg just at a time when uh, he was looking for someone who had some knowledge of the financial markets, uh, uh, but at the same time uh, didn't spend a lot of money on television. And uh, we got to know each other, and uh, it grew from there. Mm -hmm. So all three of you are white males. Um, are there any uh, minority people in positions like yours? Are there many women in positions like yours? There's more women than there are yeah. minorities. There's a gradually increasing number of minorities. Mm -hmm. So the networks are very aware of that. Uh, uh, I think we should go to some of the questions from this audience. Uh, he says, uh, what about the public perception that the anchors are just talking heads without much knowledge of the subjects that they cover? Uh, that which gets yeah, us into the whole matter of celebrity, celebrity journalism. Tom? Come, come to my office for a day and uh, spend a day with us. And it's true at the other networks anyway. Uh, it, it just doesn't apply at all to Jennings. And I, yeah, seriously, I invite whoever wrote that to. He's right. a in, intensely curious and intellectual person who has a sometimes more of a hand in uh, in what we do every night than the rest of us who edit the program would like. But and if there are ever any doubt of that, give the lie to that is when something unexpected happens and these anchors have to broadcast hour after hour. And, mm -hmm. and when the Challenger blew up. There's no possible way that Tom Brokaw, who then went on the air for 12 straight hours, could have quickly learned all about space, all the knowledge of space that he displayed uh, over that 12-hour period. He, he knew the story because he, had, he knew that it was important that he know it and worked very hard on it over the years. And on that day, it paid off. Bloomberg, you don't have stars, right? No, I mean, everybody's a reporter. Uh, the people who build careers, whether it's our organization or, or, in, or any other news organization, if you look really closely, there are people who learned how to write. And by write, I mean truly write, or learned how to cover stories at a very fundamental level. Uh, too often in this business, uh, people come in and apply for jobs, and you spend a lot of time talking to people who say they write, but what they really mean is they rewrite AP copy or they rewrite other things. Uh, but the real good ones do write, they eventually find their way on air. Um, there are other factors as to what makes a good air person, not a good air person, but inevitably the ones who really rise to the top have had that writing experience. I think that's the most valuable. This is, uh, this says, follow up the comment re, maybe we're not doing enough to explain how it is relevant. Isn't that the only thing we need reporters for, rather than rushing to tell us five minutes before someone standing next to them on the White House lawn, the latest gossip? Sure. I, mean, it, 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 I think it's very important that you have reporters tell you what happened, first of all, and use their judgment in, in, in selecting the important facts. But I think it's very helpful when, when either that reporter or a, a reporter you assign to it separately can take you through the relevance of something. And, we, and if there is a trend in the evening news reporting in recent years, it's do more and more pieces on the relevance of developing stories. Mm -hmm. But that is a complaint that people in the business have that too often we're just telling the story as it's transpiring and rarely giving people a sense of what led to this story. We just don't uh, teach people enough about the history of the world in explaining why something just happened. Well, that's not entirely our job. Uh, you know, people have to come 
have to bring something to the newscast. I mean, certainly good writing, good broadcast writing, if you have an ongoing story, does recap at certain levels what's gone on and, and after you, you, know, you have your lead, your headline, whatever, and then you can recap later on in the story. Um, but at some point, you have to assume that people are, have some context for the story. I mean, Do you think uh, that it, people know the difference between Tutsis and Hutus, even now? Let's put it this way: well, for, the people, for the people who care, no, for the people who care, they probably do. Okay. All right, for the people who don't care, and they never will. I think they did at the time of the, the two major in 1994, and then again in '96 when you had the first calamity there, and then you had the migration um, that really led to the end of Zaire. Ultimately, we had that kind of background and that kind of reporting. I think the problem with the evening news is sometimes if you the, the big stories, I think, these days get covered very, very well. Uh, I, I actually think lately, w given that we may be a couple of weeks away from a strike that may or may not happen vis-a-vis -vis Iraq, there's been an awful lot of, of background and, and context and timelines already given. I noticed that NBC is doing a whole program, uh, or most of it, devoting its entire half hour to Iraq tomorrow night. It's, it's the sort of third, fourth, what I mentioned earlier, the not front page news tomorrow stories that we generally don't have the time to uh, do in, in, with that much background and detail. And, and it's also true that it's very hard for television news to explain subjects of great complexity because the advantage you have in the newspaper is you can go back and reread that paragraph. And even though sometimes we repeat what we just said, it's, it's just hard. And I think, unfortunately, despite the hours of coverage we've given to the conflict in Bosnia, that the average viewer of the network evening newscast, if you sat down and said, tell me who are the Bosnians, tell me who are the Serbs, tell me who are the Bosnian Serbs, would be very hard pressed to do it. But and, we used to have and, the and, NBC and white papers to explain those true. things. We don't have those that, kinds of shows true. anymore. But those who, interestingly, and, I, and you're certainly in a much different spectrum of media now, and, and, and but even then, I think it's hard, tele, it's just certain things are hard for television to do well. At some point, we don't have to. I mean, you, you, maybe we don't have white papers anymore, but you've got thousands of people every morning reading the New York Times on the train, and they're, they're getting it, and that's fine, and that, that's something, at a certain point, we don't have to cover that. This one says, you all sound as if the story controls your programming. Do you feel, though, your network has its own particular spin, whether it be liberal, impartial, conservative? Is it something you even recognize? Well, we, we try hard to avoid spins, uh, and, and usually you can catch them. Uh, I know there's a school of thought that says that the, the, uh, the media, the so-called establishment media, tend to be liberal. Uh, certainly a lot of liberals don't believe that. Uh, there's uh, the conservatives, uh, you know, generally excoriate uh, the media. Uh, we're all products of our backgrounds and educations and that sort of thing, but we really do try very hard uh, to play it down the middle because once, if it were to be true that you were favoring one side or another, it would probably become pretty apparent quickly and you'd lose your credibility. Hmm. Jesse Helms would get after you. Uh, how are ratings determined? Are they truly representative of the audience? I don't know. I, don't I think know if you have high it. ratings, you say yes, and if you have low ratings, you say no. <laughs> well, it, I mean, in, I could explain briefly because I, I I tend to read these and try to figure them out, and, and it's very difficult. But the Nielsen rating system is basically five thousand households in America that are wired up uh, and with a box that basically tells you what the channel, what, what channel the set was tuned to at any given point. And they've been getting more and more sophisticated on this and trying to make sure that the sample is truly reflective of the American public. But it's a very fragile system, particularly when you get ratings uh, that are close. For example, the ratings of the three network evening newscasts are, not, it's not unusual for them to be differences of tenths of points between the three. So it's by no means a precise system. And there are certainly areas of the population that are not accurately counted. Uh, certain uh, minority groups are certainly undercounted. Uh, people like college students are undercounted. There's no Nielsen boxes in dormitories or things like that. Uh, so it, 
it's it's the best system that's available, but it's not a very precise system. But it does really determine how much money you can charge for a show, and so it's important for you to get the good ratings. That's correct. And that's a big problem. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a necessary evil. I, we, we keep talking about television, but uh, recently I've, I've taken a great interest in, in radio ratings here, uh, particularly here in the New York metropolitan area, as we've tried to build on our programming and try to measure and try to measure the people who actually find out exactly who's listening. I mean, that's, that's the first thing you want to do. And uh, I've been, I, I, Arbitron is what uh, rates radio stations. I've been to their headquarters down in, in Maryland and gone through the books that people actually fill out. And you can see the kind of comments they write. You can see where they come from. You can see how articulate they are. Um, it's, it's an imperfect system. Um, you're right, if it's a, it's a good rating, you find a lot of good things to like about it. I will tell you this, that there are parts of it, certain segments of the population get paid uh, to fill out the rating books, uh, other people don't. Um, there is a real tendency on the, on the part of some people to be more inclined to pick up the phone from a salesman at night who says, gee, would you like to be a rating person? Yes, I probably would, okay. And they send them all a paraphernalia, and out of those people, maybe a small fraction actually do fill out the book and send it back in. Um, there's a certain segment of the population, I don't know how many people in this room who have an interest in this kind of discussion have ever been a rating household. Have you ever filled out a rating Anybody book? here? No. No. Okay. So I, I'm... One person. I hope you're listening to NPR. So here, so here you have... No, but... <laughs> well, but it's an interesting point. I mean, I just from our small sample here, these are people who probably listen to Leonard's show or listen to National Public Radio. Um, I try to present the, us taking a certain kind of news, which uh, many of you may or may not have listened to. Uh, maybe you watch the, uh, the evening news here. But the fact of the matter is you're not directly counted. Someone else is representing you. We have very little time. I want to get a, just one or two more in here. This one says, for young, just starting out journalists, should we focus on having a specialty in our reporting that is some subject to be more knowledgeable about? And uh, also public journalism, what do you think about it? Should they specialize, Tom? Uh, you probably specialized in, uh, in foreign reporting, or did you not? Uh, is that something you just accidentally fell into? No, I was always, my parents are both Europeans, and I was interested in, in working overseas. It's a difficult question. I also have almost no role in ever hiring anybody, but I do think that there are, just, just a very general point, there's an awful lot of young people now who study communications, uh, which I, I don't know exactly what programs are like in schools for study of radio or study of television. But it's a guaranteed A. Well, no, I, you know, <laughs> the, the person who first hired me said something that I, I, I think has held in the people I've seen do well in the business, and that is just it's much, much better to develop a, a good, solid academic background if you're still in school or some, some smarts, and that the television or the radio is very easily taught compared to whatever other knowledge you might bring. I mean, they're, they're, they're basically, I think ah. you would know better, but they're looking for, for smart people. They'll teach them television, teach them the, the craft, rather than the other way around. I, I agree, and, and in terms of once you get a job, uh, it seems to me that the important thing is to learn as much as you can about, if you're going to be a reporter, you ought to learn how to report and get as many assignments as you can and, and work with an editor and practice your craft. and. Then later, if you decide you want to be an economics reporter or a law reporter, perhaps you can take some additional education even while you're working and, and move toward that sort of a goal. But I think starting out, you just ought to get the best experience you possibly can. There is a craft. There's an art to this. It really is. And I find, for instance, I can give specific examples in our shop where we started out where we had a tremendous amount of people very, very well versed in the financial markets and business and news and all that sort of thing uh, who were print writers or they were ex-brokers or they uh, were involved in, in, in the markets in some other way. And when we started out, it was very difficult to get them to put together a good broadcast story. So what I did, I, was, I went out and hired some people who were used to covering local news and fires and car wrecks and that sort of thing and sat them down and got the whole place organized in a sense. It was easy for me to teach those people about the uh, New York Stock Exchange than it was for them to teach the writers how to be uh, good broadcasters. But we uh, eventually came to be a pretty good group. 
We'll close with this one. It says, we know that most of America gets its news solely from television. Does that give you a greater need to see that important public uh, information and news is distributed by television? Do you feel a responsibility knowing that people are getting it from you more often than from the New York Times or the Washington Post or the LA Times, Chicago uh, Tribune? I, I think absolutely I feel a responsibility to do a good job and to inform people of what's important and, and, uh, and that's a challenge producers and editors um, face every day. And, and the fact is that in many American cities there isn't even a good newspaper. Uh, no. You will see, uh, you will see in, in many cities uh, newspapers that have almost no foreign news in them, and 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 weak national news. So yes, you feel that burden. Do you understand why people go to television? Because actually, it's giving them a lot more than the local newspapers. That's correct. Yeah, I second entirely. I, I find it a depressing fact. Television is a very expensive medium to produce. Uh, requires a tremendous amount of resources. Uh, I think right now we're in a, in a in a golden age in the sense that there are so many people competing for this. I think over time and in the not too near distant future, you will see people cut back in some areas. That some of the competitors will be out of the market, uh, and you know the, you, you'll find people a, a few people spending a lot more money, doing a lot more coverage, uh, and. Uh, I, 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 that's what will still attract people to television. I mean, I think it's that the luxuriousness of all the pictures and the sound and the, the anchors. Well, maybe we just have too much right now. I was shocked to read some ratings. Uh, I'm happy to talk about ratings because mine are good now. Uh, <laughs> and I, I read about um, the ratings of one of the, the new uh, cable networks, and it turned out that it nationally had worse ratings in a quarter hour than I have here in New York City. Uh, so I thought, gee, uh, how can they keep that going? After all, they're spending a lot of money for to put that thing on. They got all those electric bills and the camera people and all that. Uh, I, have I have an audio engineer, a few producers, and they stick me in front of a microphone. Uh, so I, I, I suspect that there's going to be some kind of a, a sorting out and Darwin will be proved to be right once again. Only, maybe not the best, but only the uh, the ones that are most prepared to survive will survive. Actually, if I can just make one other point about the future before you finish, that I don't know how far away this is. I'm not technologically minded enough to know, but I do think that somewhere down the road there will be a much more interactive process to the way people get their news, and that may for one thing, it may solve a lot of the problems that people now feel vis-a-vis -vis the media. There may be a time when we produce a, an evening newscast that is much more like a menu, and we may not make the judgment, what's the top story, what's the second story. We may just produce... And we'll click it on. And if you oh, want to know yeah. everything... That's happening now. It's, it's already started. Yeah, and if you want to know, it, it's happening on, on the Internet. Yeah, I think it, there, it, we're not that far away from a day when if you want to know everything there is to know about the Rwanda story, you will find it. If you want to just zip right past it and get right to uh -huh. the nonsense in Washington, you can. This is the news on demand concept, and, and we are seeing it already playing out on the Internet. It's, it's, it's very appealing, and I already use it myself. If I'm anywhere in the world, I can get the New York Times or at least the major stories of the New York Times, or if, if I want to get a British newspaper, I can do that online. It's, it, but it's interesting because it will, it will let people do their own editing, which sounds good and probably is good to some extent. But on the other hand, I worry a little bit that if we lose the network evening news programs where people make a lot of important editing decisions and, and pass along news to people who otherwise might not select it, that we're missing something there. Right. Too. One of our jobs, I think, is to take something that people might not think they find interesting and make it interesting and actually give them something valuable in the process. Well, I think you've given us valuable stuff in, in the process of this evening. I want to thank all of the people in the audience here for coming tonight in this terrible weather. My special thanks to the Y and, of course, to Matt Drudge for making this all possible, and to these gracious men, William Wheatley, Tom Nagorski, and Robert Leveroni, my undying gratitude to Emily Hoffman, without whom none of this would have been possible. Thank you all.
Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.